I started out to be a musician and I actually left uh, university after a year to go and study with a very famous musician in Philadelphia, William Kincaid. He was probably the most famous flutist of the time. Wow. And what I realized, and of course, there were many other um, excellent flutists that came to study with him as well. What I realized in the process of taking lessons is that I just didn't have what it takes to spend the many, many hours practicing that it requires to develop the physical and, and of course, mental skills to play beautifully. I would get bored. So one day I said, why don't I go do something practical? So I, I um, went back to university changed my curriculum to all science courses, which was really tough to do. Um, and one of my professors, a man by the name of Roger Metman, invited me into his laboratory to do experiments. And I think once I started doing experiments, there was no turning back. I didn't become a medical doctor. I became a research scientist. Mm -hmm. I eventually was accepted at the Rockefeller University where I became uh, where I studied molecular biology. I got pregnant when I was in high school. So I had a baby at 18. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I dropped out of school. I persuaded the school authorities to allow me to take the exams on my own. Mm -hmm. And I managed to graduate first in my class. Um, and then I talked my way into Syracuse University. But the husband came and he wanted me to come with him to Germany. And I said, let me finish the semester. And he said, no, you've got to come with me now. And he basically beat me up and left and took the money out of the joint account that I had carefully saved. Um, so I picked myself up. And I managed to continue my education. I got a scholarship because I was a good student. And so I had a tough time, <clears throat> but I actually, I remarried when I was ready for uh, university, uh, for graduate school. So I was married during the time that uh, I spent in, um, in graduate school. Thank you so much for sharing, Nina. Uh, this is, um, a, so, so, so please tell me if um, you would be okay with questions along these lines. Otherwise I can edit this out. Yeah. Well, um, you're, you're gonna have to decide whether you edit it out or not. No, no, usually we keep everything in the recording because this is your story, however you wanna tell it. But this but is a, Sorry, but, but of course, right now, it all of that is coming back because the ability of women to mm -hmm. uh, to have children when they want them and not when they happen mm -hmm. uh, by accident uh, is in doubt once again, and that's a very difficult thing to relive and to see that women are facing the same thing that I faced before Roe versus Wade. Wow, thank you. Um, would you tell me where you found support, encouragement, inspiration as you were going through these very challenging, even unusually challenging for your times, um, times in your life? I didn't. I didn't receive support. My family was simply embarrassed um, and didn't want much to do with me. Um, but I was determined not to end up spending my life as a waitress. So I just studied as hard as I could. I had some skills, very fortunately, 
the Russian language mm -hmm. ca ca capacity came in very handy because I ended up doing living in a kind of one room apartment with my my daughter and doing translations for Russian to English for something called biological abstracts. And I also gave music lessons. So that's how I managed to support a child, but it was very difficult. Wow. Um, how do you envision we could do better as an academic community in supporting women through either difficult times or different choices now in 2023? Well, that's an interesting uh, point in that the last year, uh, my last year in undergraduate uh, university at Syracuse, Syracuse University gave me a $1,000 grant in aid. And that made all the difference in the world to me. Interestingly enough, in recent years, um, one of the deans um, of the College of Liberal Arts started a program for people just like me, that is single parents or, or young people who are interested in science education but can't afford it. Mm -hmm. And that program, I'm helping to endow that program now. And I'm really delighted to do that uh, with Syracuse University because that little grant in aid way back then uh, helped me survive and make it uh, through my last year in, in university. And come out, I actually ended up graduating a second in my class, which was not too terrible. Oh, wow. Any standout moments that you want to specifically mention? Well, I think the standout moment came when I, I suddenly became very popular because suddenly I had really cutting edge science to talk about. And I was invited to the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory to give a talk. And it was kind of toward the end of the day, and I had an appointment to meet with Jim Watson. Mm -hmm. And I was leaving the Demerits Laboratory, and I ran into this tiny woman. She about came up to my chin, and I thought, this must be Barbara McClintock. Although I had gone to meetings at Cold Spring Harbor, mm -hmm. During my graduate work at the Rockefeller University, I had never met McClintock. She invited me to come down to her lab. I kind of blew off the meeting with Jim Watson, <laughs> whom I had gotten to know the previous summer in Woods Hole and didn't much like. <laughs> um, and so I spent the afternoon talking to Barbara. And I was just completely blown away by this person. Anything she talked about, she had so much insight into, whether it was science or people or politics or whatever we talked about. I was so impressed that I went back to Baltimore where I was working at the time. And God, it, it, of course I was, she was still being supported by the Carnegie Institution of Washington, even though she was at Cold Spring Harbor. And I was at the Department of Embryology of the Carnegie Institution. So we had all of the Carnegie yearbooks where she tended to publish. Mm -hmm. I got all those yearbooks down and I copied back in the days when we Xerox things. Mm -hmm. I copied all the things that she'd written and I started reading and I thought, what a fabulous research project to figure out. She was saying, you know, it was it was before... It was so much before we recognized transposable elements that people were still questioning whether what she was saying was at all generalizable from the mm -hmm. experiments she had done in corn. Um, but right at that time, I was kind of rolling it around in my mind and thinking, 
you know, the funding for plant research is very uh, slim. Mm -hmm. And I have a child. And if I take a university position, I'm going to have to teach. And I have a child to raise. And embarking on something where people were saying that you couldn't even clone plant DNA, it sounded totally impossible. Mm -hmm. And about that time, my boss, Don Brown, who had then by then become the department chair, called me into his office. Um, and he said, we have a position open and we have, you know, we announced to everybody that we're not going to hire from within mm -hmm. the department, but we think we're we're discriminating against you because you're here. And if you want the job, it's yours. Wow. Not a very fancy job offer, but my instant thought was, well, now I could do this because Carnegie has a longer view uh, than most organizations and it still does. Mm -hmm. And they were willing to support me to take the risk of figuring out how to clone plant DNA and do all of the things that needed to be done to start a whole new area of science, which is plant molecular biology, which didn't at the time exist. Mm -hmm. And of course, there were major problems in cloning plant DNA, but we solved them eventually. And it took a few years, but we did clone the elements. And Barbara McClintock's accumulated uh, genetic knowledge about the elements made it absolutely beautiful to understand her genetic deductions at the molecular level. Mm -hmm. And she remained interested until the very end um, She actually thought that you you remember that she got a Nobel Prize for her work mm -hmm. in the 40s and 50s, mm -hmm. not until the 1980s, 1983, I think was her Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. Com that's compared to Watson and Crick, who did their work about the same time, early 50s, as McClintock and had a Nobel Prize within a decade. Right. Mm -hmm. But McClintock waited 30 years for hers. And of course, by the time she got it, it was more of a pain in the neck than it was <laughs> a pleasure because everybody suddenly wanted a piece of her and she was already uh, in her 80s and it was a physical burden. Wow. Well, that brings me to um, your thoughts on fame and acclaim and prestige in your own life. Um, how was it serving on the National Science Board? How was it being awarded innumerable um, laudatory awards? I'm not listing them here, but I want you to tell us a little bit about the thoughts that ran to, through your mind once um, this level of fame and prestige came to you. Well, the probably the the one that was that made the most difference was the National Medal of Science. Mm -hmm. And that came in a very surprising way. I so I need to take a little sidestep into um where my early work in plant molecular biology took me, which was, of course, talking about GMOs. Mm -hmm. so we created some of the very first transgenic plants using agrobacterium technology. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was, because I was one of the very first ones, I ended up on advisory boards in Washington and I ended up talking about GMOs to whoever would listen to my lecture, which was more and more 
people, including doing a series of three lectures on GMOs, the Ulam lectures of the Santa Fe Institute. I mm -hmm. was then on the external faculty of the Santa Fe Institute, and I did these three lectures. I believe it was 2006. And on the way home, I had, I was at the Albuquerque Airport and had a message on my cell phone, which I answered, and it was John Bullwright from the National Academy of Sciences calling on behalf of the president of the National Academy of Sciences, asking whether I'd be interested in serving as the science advisor to the Secretary of State. And I was already retirement age, so I thought, why not? <laughs> you know, if not this, what? <laughs> if not now, when? So I said, sure, but I really didn't think I would get the job. Oddly enough, I did. So I was uh, scheduled to go to Washington in 2006. And then the notice of this science award, I had also been quite involved with a Washington group called the Washington Advisory Group mm -hmm. that had gotten involved in helping the king of Saudi Arabia design his new university, the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology. And in the middle of one of the meetings to consider how to design this university, I got a call from the White House <laughs> saying I'd received the National Medal of Science. So I ended up sharing it with the people that were at the at the meeting and we had a lovely party and so forth. But all this came together. So the National Medal of Science ceremony, uh, which took us all to the White House, including as much family as I could get in, <laughs> um, in 2006 and and actually Condi Rice was the science was the secretary of state at the time and she actually came to my to my award ceremony at the white house which was very lovely and then just a few days later i was uh sworn in as the science advisor at the state department so all that came at the same time and i have to say that I didn't have time to think about to luxuriate in the in the uh, in the honors and awards. Being science advisor in the State Department was was tough work mm. uh, because people who tend to go into international relations are are not too much of the scientific mindset. And often, if the policy fits with the science, great. If it doesn't, the heck with the science. <laughs> That's difficult, a difficult environment to work in for a scientist for whom the weight of the evidence is the most important thing, most persuasive mm -hmm. kind of argument you can bring to wear, bear. And when the weight of the evidence turns into just another opinion, it's it's tough and pretty humbling because you have to work in that environment. Wow. Anyway, I think that kind of led to other things. So I very sh early in my tenure at um, State, I remember I was on my way to Japan for some official meetings. And I was awarded an honorary degree at my alma mater, the Rockefeller University, which was a huge honor. Um, so what effect, I, I mean, I never had time to stop and think about it, but frankly, what honors like that do for you is they give you a little bit of a voice mm -hmm. Your 15 minutes of fame, <laughs> you really have to make use of it. And the way I made use of it was to spend my time talking to any audience that would listen about the importance of genetically modi genetic modification to the future of agriculture. 
And of course, that issue for a long time, the global mindset was very anti GMO. And curiously enough, in the last roughly year, year and a half, that mindset has begun to change. <coughs> So, so that's a positive development that um, gives you comfort and hope? That's a very positive development. I think country after country is realizing that it needs genetically modified organisms because the price of, of agrochemicals have, has skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. And the global food supply is of course very badly threatened by what's happening now in ukraine but i need to tell you my last adventure mm -hmm. so i served as science advisor from 2007 to 2010 and then um the president of the new university, KAUST, I actually had attended the opening ceremonies, uh, the groundbreaking ceremonies of KAUST, as well as the opening ceremonies, both as a scientist and as a, a representative of the State Department. And I had actually given a lecture about the future of agriculture at their opening symposium. It was based on a workshop that I ran, which was one of the last things I did at the State Department that brought in both academics and people from the um, from various government agencies to look at the issue of the impact of climate change on agriculture. It was just beginning to dawn on people that climate change might have an adverse effect on agriculture, particularly what drew people's attention to it was the very hot summer of 2003, which was about three and a half degrees above average in Europe. And many people heard about the number of people who died, mm -hmm. but very few people realized that crop yields had gone down by 25 to 30 percent. Wow. which subsequent research shows that that was precisely in line with the roughly 10 degree decrease in crop yield for a one degree increase in average summer temperature. So suddenly people were keenly aware of that issue. But to go back to my story, what transpired after I left the State Department was that the president of the new university, which was built in just record time in two years, mm -hmm. came to offer me a, a professorship, a distinguished professorship at KAUST. And I said, well, I'll do that if I can um, begin to implement some of the ideas that we had developed in this workshop. And they said, fine. And so I went to KAUST and spent the next four years establishing their Center for Desert Agriculture. Um, I ended up leaving for political reasons because I got into a position where I was afraid that if I didn't personally get myself out of, uh, out of KAUST, the work that I had started would would basically be swept under the rugs and I didn't want the project to, to crash. It was just a political mm -hmm. uh, impasse that I had gotten into with one of the senior administrators. Mm -hmm. I wasn't the, the only one he drove out, but he really wanted all of the power to himself. In any event, um, Fast forward to today, I really would like to brag about the fact that there is a, a greenhouse based on the design principles that we oh. uh, developed. It's cooled with seawater rather than fresh water. It is uh, powered with solar panels. 
And one of the things that we began to develop in at the time that I was there was a kind of um, material that would exclude heat from greenhouses. You know, the greenhouse effect, mm -hmm. greenhouse traps heat. Mm -hmm. Now, if you could exclude the part of the spectrum, the heat part of the spectrum, the infrared, and let through the visible light, the part of the spectrum that plants use, it would be a great boon to agriculture in very hot environments. And that is now a reality. And frankly, um, it just won an innovation award in the US from a couple of, uh, of engineering societies. Congratulations. Yes, well, congratulations to the student, Ryan Leffers, who actually carried all those things forward. I'm really proud of the fact that those ideas have found a voice and are beginning to be implemented. So Ryan and his company have just built a demonstration uh, greenhouse in Dubai to show that the technology works. So how, how wonderful. Um, it is. It is lovely to see that people took up those things and carried them forward. Um, on the interest of time, I want to ask you an all important question, especially for our audience of early career people, which is your what you wish for them to take home as messages or ideas or lessons from your own story. I think that the basic lesson that I want to communicate is how fascinating it is to be a scientist. Life is never boring because you're always learning something new. And that's probably the most exciting kind of enterprise that people can, uh, can spend their life on. Wow. Um, on that very high note, I'm going to close the recording.